the show starts in three, two, one, go. What is going on, Kane Sport? And good morning to you all. It is Friday, May 17th. I'm Azubi Charles, joined by Stephen Wagner. And thank you for joining us this morning on Good Morning Kane Sport to start today. Before we get things going, I got a special segment I want to call the newest Miami commit. <laughs> We're going to start the morning off with a little, you know, song by Trick Daddy the U to, to celebrate the Hurricanes' latest commitment. Yesterday landed a big, big offensive lineman with a lot of upside out of Jacksonville 2025 guy. Steven, you've been all over his commitment. TK, if you guys know TK Mew, ever since he got that offer and things have moved pretty, pretty rapidly since then. Talk about, you know, his commitment. What are your thoughts on, you know, him as a prospect as well? Yeah, it's just really a kid that kind of came out of nowhere. So uh, things started off uh, last week about nine days ago. Well, ten days ago now. Um, he he landed a Miami offer after Alex Mirabal had a chance to get him to his high school. Um, the day after that, about 13 hours later to be specific, he announces that he's gone ahead and locked in an official visit. And then eight days after that, we get wind that – this kid is getting ready to go ahead and pull the trigger. He's getting ready to go ahead and announce a commitment. Um, this moved at an absolutely rapid pace. I mean, this was ab- like this was like a like a flash of lightning. All of a sudden, this kid comes out of absolutely nowhere. Did not have a very large offer, or well, actually, I take it back because he did have twenty something offers, but did not have many offers to big programs. I believe uh, his other power conference offers were to Rutgers or excuse me, not Rutgers, were to Louisville, Syracuse, and UCF, um, all of which it seemed like had done a pretty good job for for him. But, I mean, the moment that Miami came into the picture, it became very apparent that Miami was the nuclear front runner. Um, You know, it took very, very little uh, for Mew to know that he wanted to commit to Miami. Um, Things moved very, very quickly, you know, as we've already said. Um, and this wasn't something that that he needed a ton of debate for. He knew that he did want to end up going to Miami. But, I mean, more generally, you know, this this is also a kid who was not ranked uh, one day before he ended up committing to the Hurricanes. Then he ultimately does end up uh, being ranked. He's a three star prospect. Uh, who's he's he's a three star or he became a three star prospect shortly before uh, he went ahead and committed to Miami, but you look at his measure, you look at his measurables, his measurables are very good, but then you look at his offer list, you look at the attention that some other schools have shown in him, and some fans are probably asking themselves, you know, man, why are we going after a guy that has not received very much national attention? But more, like, I, I really think this more speaks to Mirabal and Cristobal simply saying that they're going to put their own faith and their individual player evaluations above whatever evaluations the rest of the recruiting industry or whatever other schools think they found um, in their in different recruits. Um, this is a guy who very clearly has very, very high grades. We've heard that he's been compared to Inez Cooper. They think that he can be an Inez Cooper type of guy. Um, and I actually did a little bit of research, and it, it, the comparisons between the two guys are really, really remarkable. Um, you know, both were guys who were ranked somewhere around the thousand mark coming out of high school. Um, they had a handful of offers to power conference programs. Um, Mirabal and Cristobal spotted them and really felt like they found diamonds in the rough that no one else had figured out yet. They really do think that this guy is going to be a star, that this is going to be a dude who's going to be drafted ahead of guys who are listed as four- and five-star recruits. This is Mirabal and Cristobal betting on themselves, basically, and saying our offensive line evaluation is better than the evaluations of everyone else in the country. And Quite honestly speaking, they really might be the two best O-line evaluators in the country. They, there is a very, very strong argument that they find and develop talent better than anyone else. They know superstars when they see them. They know stars when they see them. 
And I think that they just had really, really high grades on Mew and knew this is a guy who we are going to want. Um, we're not going to hesitate to go ahead and bet on ourselves here whenever we know that we're right. Um, so we're going to see how things go ahead and pan out. But this is absolutely a guy that they have a lot of faith in. Um, they have a lot of confidence in themselves. They really think that they have found a guy that no one else in America has clicked to. They think, man, we're not sure why no one else has figured this out. But this is a guy who needs to be recruited by a school like Miami. And this is a kid who we definitely want at Miami. And knowing the level that Mirabal and Cristobal's offensive lines have played at in the past, I mean, it's kind of hard to make an argument against them or say, man, you don't know what you're talking about. Because frankly, I mean, I think that they do. I think that if this was a lesser school um, or, you know, a school with a different offensive line staff, you know, you might, you know, have a couple of questions. You might kind of scratch your head a little bit, um, you know, maybe wonder what all went into that decision. Um, but I think with these two guys, you absolutely have to say, yeah, I'm going to have to bet that they know what they're doing. The same way that Nick Saban, you know, would take a lower level three star quarterback and everyone would just say, yeah, I'm going to have faith in this guy because it's Nick Saban. Um, I think it's the exact same thing with Cristobal and Mirabal. Yeah, those two guys are well known around the country for developing offensive linemen, you know, finding those guys that people may overlook, but, you know, turned some heads in college. You know, they have the highest paid offensive lineman in the NFL right now, a guy that they recruited out of the high school ranks, developing from their school. A lot of guys, you know, I've spoken with on the offensive line, love talking about that, how they develop, you know, the best offensive lineman in the NFL. You know, arguably a young guy like Francis Mount, you know, coming in, establishing himself as one of the best in the country. You know, their first real recruiting cycle down in Miami. And man, you know, this offensive line, you know, down in Coral Gables looks like one of these strong points for the, for the Canes this upcoming year. And, you know, it's built by Coach Mirabal. It's built by Coach Cristobal. A lot of people you know, like to call it the Great Wall of Mirabal on Twitter, which I think is hilarious or X or whatever you want to call it. But they know what they're doing. I feel like if there's a position that you know Miami will always be set in, I think that's offensive line. And, you know, TK is the first O-line commit of the 2025 class. Now they're up to seven you know, prospects. I'm going to run through that list real quick for you guys. So at the top, on three's highest rated prospect for Miami, the 2025 class, Elijah Melendez. Then we got Brock Schott. Gerard Pringle, the running back out of R1, Luca Gilbert, Luke Nickel, Wade and Charles. And then we got TK, you know, filling out the bottom right there as he newly minted three-star in that 2025 class. I had the chance to turn on this kid's tape. And, man, it's kind of hard to think, you know, how he was kind of under-recruited and is just getting that star ranking. I feel like the first thing that came to my mind is this kid's a bruiser. You know, you turn on his huddle, you see him pulling from the tackle position, you know, clearing out a defensive end, you know, make his way to the second level, block under linebacker, just clearing out lanes for guys. And the measurables are there, 6'5", 315 pounds, moves extremely well. And you can tell why, you know, a program like Miami wanted to get this kid on board so quickly. I feel like he has that potential to, to, to blow up and become, you know, a four-star guy and kind of get that national attention. He has a little bit of a now, not as much, but I feel like a lot more eyes are going to be on him now that he's committed to Miami. So it's great to see that they got on him early, targeted him and made sure they got up, you know, in Coral Gables. Steven, I want to ask you, like I said, seven guys in that 2025 class, TK being the first offensive lineman. So what are your early thoughts on Miami's 2025 class heading into June where we're going to see a lot of official visits and a lot of more guys come off the board and commit to the Canes? Yeah, they are off to a good start. Um, you know, they do have seven guys already, and they have the biggest foundational pieces that they're going to need in this class. You know, they have Luke Nickel. They have a quarterback who's ranked in the top 150. Um, you know, they have uh, two very good four-star tight ends. Um, you know, Brock shot and Luca Gilbert um like the pieces are absolutely there you can't forget about uh Wade and Charles you can't forget about Gerard Pringle you know all the guys that you just mentioned um you know you should also consider that TK is right now the only three star yeah. that Miami has committed in this class um the rest of the guys are all four star players um they're obviously still in play for a couple of five star guys um, you see how some of which we think are probably going to end up committing later instead of sooner. You know, they're probably going to commit um, a little bit closer to signing day. I'm talking about DJ Pickett probably being the biggest one. Um, but Miami right now, their recruiting class is ranked 15th nationally. I expect that to go up this summer. Um, I don't expect June to be a massive, massive month for commitments, but I do expect July 
to be very, very big. The overwhelming majority of recruits that I have talked to that I've got that I've been able to find stuff out on, um, the overwhelming bulk of them want to commit. They want to pull the trigger uh, at some point in July or in August. There's a handful that want to go ahead and do it in June. They want to commit a little bit early. Um, there are some that uh, are looking to commit in uh, August, a little bit closer to the start of the actual fo- of the actual fall football season. But the bulk of these guys, they want to go on their official visits. They want to wait a couple of weeks, and then they want to go ahead and pull the trigger um, and commit to the Hurricanes. Or, excuse me, not to the Hurricanes, but they want to announce their commitments. A couple of those, obviously, are, of course, going to be um, commitments to Miami. But, yeah, there's probably some – uh, there's probably you know some some 25 guys that Miami's recruiting um, that are looking at making a decision at some point, kind of in that timeline. Um, I myself would expect Miami to end up getting um, another 10 to 12 commits um, in between June and August. Now at that point, you know now you're probably looking at Miami having maybe somewhere in the range of about 20 commits total. Um, at that point, you're really just starting to focus on, you know, getting kind of the finishing touches uh, on your 2025 class. You know, you want to go out, you want to try to nab an Elijah Griffin. You want to try to get uh, a DJ Pickett. Um, you want to try to grab, you know, a couple of these really high-end guys who are maybe looking at, um, you know, making a decision a little bit closer to signing day. Uh, maybe an Usman Kroma, uh, the four-star running back out of Georgia that Miami has been very, very high on. Um, I expect this summer to be very big for Miami, especially the month of July. Um, like I said, I think there could be a handful of players that commit uh, on official visits, you know, maybe two, maybe three. Um, and I think that there could be a good amount of players that end up pulling the trigger on their, uh, on their, or excuse me, uh, right before the start of their season in August. But I think the majority are going to go ahead and make their announcements in July. Yeah, I have to agree with you on that. I spoke with uh, 2025 four star wide receiver Vernell Brown. He's kind of in that same boat of prospects where they're saying, hey, I want to take all my official visits in June, sit a little bit in July, and then towards the end of July start of uh, August before their senior year, you know, announce their commitment and get off the board and focus on their senior year. So I have to agree with you. I think heading into the fall around August or early August, mid-August, late or early September, I think Miami will have about 20 guys, maybe a little bit less on the board. And then throughout the season, you know, there's always those guys, like you mentioned, a DJ Pickett and Elijah Griffin, who kind of want to see a season play out with the program and then, you know, make that decision on signing day. So a lot to be excited about, you know, for the Canes and that recruiting a lot of big time, you know, Wales, like they like to call it, you know, with the Hurricanes on their mind. A lot of flip targets as well, still on the board for the Canes. So it's going to be exciting next few months. So m- make sure, you know, you, you stay tuned in on Canes. So we're going to have you covered with all the official visits and much, much more coming out of that. I think it's funny, though, so I kind of want to talk about this. You mentioned Miami has about like the 16th or 17th class in the country right now. I saw someone on Twitter post. It's like, you know, usually at this point, Miami's sitting at the 40 to the 30 range, and then they make, you know, that big push at the end. They're like, if we're sitting top 25 right now, I think we'll end up with the number one class. But like you mentioned, all four-star guys besides TK and, you know, some quality pieces early on in that class to build and, you know, recruit more guys, but I think it's crucial having those, you know, fundamental foundation pieces that are saying, hey, you know, we're committed early, join the party, let's have a good time, let's let's try to bring back Miami. So a ton of guys on the board uh, still, and, Really excited to see these June OVs happen. One guy that we're going to be seeing on the weekend of June 7th, I went up to IMG Academy. I spoke with four-star linebacker Gavin Nix, who's originally from Orlando but plays his ball you know, at IMG. A guy that I think is really, really, really a strong prospect. I think Miami's in a really, really good spot with him. He only has three OVs lined up for June. A lot of, you know, we see a lot of these guys having five to six, maybe even more. But he said, hey, I want to focus on three schools, Miami, Florida State and Oregon. I want to take those three official visits and announce after that. Steven, you've had the chance to speak with Gavin a handful of times. Just what are your thoughts on him as a prospect, as well as, you know, where Miami stands in his recruitment heading into that June 7th OV? Man, I really like Gavin as a recruit. You know, I just think he's kind of a prototypical linebacker. Um, you know, it, it's it comes down to the old thing, you know, if it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. And that's Gavin. That Like, that really is Gavin. This guy looks like a linebacker. He talks like a linebacker. He thinks like a linebacker. He plays like a linebacker. And I also think one of the advantages that he has 
or that uh, that evaluators have and kind of, you know, getting a, a feel for where he is more generally from a talent perspective is he's at a school like IMG where he ha- where one, he's going to have every resource available, but two, he's also going to be going up against really top tier talent. We, you know, one every single every single day in practice, and then two on a national scale. Once you know, it, once their actual uh, fall season starts, and obviously, you know, he was at IMG uh, last year as well, and people started getting kind of a feel for you know just how talented he really is. There's no question about the level of competition that he's going up against. You know exactly how good a kid from IMG is. Um, whenever they're going up against, you know, the competition, the schedule that IMG is going up against, you know, you remember a couple of years ago, I mean, you know, they were playing Miami Central. Miami Central actually beat them that year, and that was kind of a testament uh, to Miami Central. In fact, I'm pretty sure that was uh, that was the game that Ruben Bain and uh, Francis Maui Noah yeah. were actually lining up against each other. Um, but – um, I really, really like – long way of saying I really like Gavin as a prospect. I think that right now we have a very good feel for exactly how good he is. He's a, four st- he's a four-star recruit, um, going to take a couple of official visits. Miami's been in the mix throughout this thing this entire time, and I think kind of the biggest telltale sign is they keep getting him back down to campus. As long as Miami keeps getting him down to campus, the Hurricanes are absolutely going to be a very, very serious option for him. Um, and it would not stun me at all if he does ultimately end up committing. Um, although I do think that we do have a little bit of ways to go before we get there. Yeah, like you mentioned, Nick you know, keeps making his way down to campus. It, it's odd. I vividly remember when, you know, Francis Malino and, you know, Riley Williams and Antonio Tripp and that whole, you know, 2023 group was always down in Miami coming to game day visits. I always, you know, saw Gavin, you know, the, the, the underclassmen with the, with the, you know, upperclassmen taking those visits to Miami. So, you know, like you mentioned, Miami's always been in it for him. And, you know, Derek Nicholson has done a great job of recruiting him, you know, kind of selling him that vision, saying, hey, we're, we're a few guys away from, you know, becoming that program, becoming, you know, Miami of old and what people, you know, know the Hurricanes as being. And he kind of sees that. He loves what they're building out there. The staff went to go visit him on Monday. He had the chance to, you know, interact with them a little bit as much as they can, you know, when they go on those in-school visits. But, you know, he, he really loves the Hurricanes. But, you know, Oregon and Florida State are going to make it hard for, for for Miami to land him a top 175 prospect coming out of IMG. So check out that update on him. He says a lot of great things about Miami, just his recruitment overall. I want to move to the other side of the ball. Guy we mentioned a little bit, Usman Kroma. Steven, you've been speaking with him as well. A guy Miami got on campus this spring and a guy a lot of schools are after. I wouldn't say Miami's near the top of the recruitment, but I wouldn't say the Hurricanes are out just yet. What are your thoughts on the Hurricanes stand and, you know, Chroma's recruitment right now? Man, it's been really, really hard to get a feel for exactly where Miami sits because he does have a very good close personal connection uh, with Matt Merritt. Matt Merritt has been a huge reason for his interest uh, in Miami. And really, it's kind of starting to look like that might be Merritt's superpower as a recruiter. Um, He was a huge reason why Gerard Pringle committed to Miami. Um, Heck, you know, Gerard felt very, very close to him whenever he was still at USF, although um, you know, recruit like Gerard, you know, maybe wasn't looking at a program like USF, um, you know, quite as close as he was, maybe some bigger schools, you know, no disrespect to USF by any means. Um, but, you know, you look at a guy like Chroma um, and the programs that are after him, Matt Merritt has kept Miami right in the middle of this entire thing. He is going to get down for an official visit. I do think that um, there's a ch- Miami's going to have a chance to be able to steal a little bit of momentum getting into uh, that visit or, or, excuse me, coming off of that visit. And that will, I, I do think that that will give Miami a chance to, you know, maybe be kind of the trendy team uh, heading into July. Although Chroma probably is looking to commit maybe a little bit closer to a se- uh, maybe a little bit closer to uh, to signing day sometime during his senior season. Um, he's come out and said uh, that he does not want to feel like he has to rush anything. And as long as he's still having to consider different programs, um, he wants to take, he wants to take his sweet time Um, because once he commits, he doesn't want to, you know, have to consider maybe flipping to another school. Um, Once he pulls the trigger, he wants to be fully locked in with that school. He doesn't want to, you know, he doesn't want to be in a position where he's second guessing himself. Um, So, 
It does feel like uh, Miami's going to have to play the long game here a little bit, but that's something that Chris Ball uh, does really, really well. He might do it better than any other head coach in the country as far as uh, it, like as a recruiter. Um, but I'm really, really intrigued to see what ends up happening here. Um, I do like the position Miami's in. I don't love it, but I do like it. Yeah, uh, Chrome has been, you know, one of the top guys on the recruiting boards, you know, entire spring and, you know, months prior to that. We had the chance to speak with some staffers who was really, really high on him. And a guy, you know, you turn on the tape, you see why programs across the country are fighting for his signature, you know, when it does eventually come. So make sure to check out that update on him. You know, one of the top recruiting targets for the Hurricanes this cycle. I want to say in the Peach State to kind of wrap up our, our little recruiting spiel, Mark Manfred, a uh, 2025 defensive back, three-star guy from Marietta, Georgia. He isn't the highest ranked guy, but a lot of big time programs are chasing him as well. He's actually the cousin of Ja'Cory Harris, which is something that I didn't know. Steven, you spoke with Mark. Just what's a quick rundown on that latest on that situation and where Miami sits there? Yeah, um, I, I Mark's another guy. It's kind of, it's been kind of hard to get a feel for just exactly where things sit with the Hurricanes because he has so many other schools after him. He's going to go ahead and take uh, that uh, that official visit um, to Miami later this uh, later this summer. Um, but he has a lot of other programs that are really after him too. Um, you know, Clemson's been another school that's been after him, Auburn, uh, Ole Miss. I mean, like, it really is a substantial list of schools that are after him um, at the moment. Um, I, I do think that it could be a little while before he goes ahead and airs that down a little bit further. Um, but, of course, getting him on campus for that official visit is going to be very, very, very big. And I think, uh, kind of like Chroma, that's going to be an opportunity for Miami to maybe gain a little bit of that momentum. He hasn't said – uh, when he plans on making that announcement, but um, I, I do think that he could, or that Miami could definitely have an opportunity um, to kind of steal a little bit of momentum away from uh, some of those SEC schools that have been after him. Because this is a kid; he's only ranked somewhere around the 700 mark in the on three industry ranking. But there are a lot of schools that believe he is much, much, much better than than the ranking system uh, has him listed at. Um, there are a lot of schools that think that this kid will have a chance to be very, very special. And I mean, you know, you look at the number of schools that are recruiting him, you look at the programs that are after him, and you a thousand percent understand exactly, uh, you know, why some of these schools think that. Yeah, ha has a little bit of canes in his blood with that Jacory Jacory Harris connection, like I said, and very, very talented guy out of the Peach State. You know, Miami's recruiting a lot of guys from up north in Georgia, and you know, hopefully they'll land a few in this next upcoming cycle. Just on the site as well this morning, we have a handful of stories as well. Start off with Jordan Campbell, went out to Miami, Hero City, had the chance to watch him. Love, love, love what I've seen from that guy. A very, very physical linebacker that can play both sides of the ball. But, you know, Miami's recruiting as a linebacker. I go 100 yards with him. Kind of talk a little bit about his move to Carroll City, his family connection there, the Hurricanes, and a few more things. Fun, he actually almost quit playing football. To, to, to play the cello. So he had a few good things to say, you know, about the game, some other things. Also have an analysis, our rundown of the top 50 roster players. We're at number 44, Justin Scott, an incoming freshman, and a lot of people are excited to have down on campus when he gets there later this summer. We also have Mario Cristobal's thoughts coming out of the ACC meetings and a lot of buzz around the Canes program. So make sure to check that out. We take a look at the defense as well to see if they've made strides from last year to now under year two with Coach Lance Kidry. So a ton of great news on the sites and recruiting the team coverage. So make sure to check it all out. And as always, we'll have more coming for you throughout the day. Like I said earlier today, this morning, thank you for joining us for Good Morning Kane Sport. I'm Azubi Charles. That is Stephen Wagner. Hope to see you guys next time.